understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. The resistance. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. It's a trap. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back. My guest today is a contributor for The Federalist. She's a former pagan, and her new project's going to be called Don't Unfriend Me or Unfriend Me. I'm not really sure. Don't what Unfriend Me. Don't Unfriend me. me. Okay. I'm actually fine with people unfriending me, but in her case, don't unfriend her. This is Donna Carol Voss. How are you, Donna? Welcome. Doing well. Thank you. So I first came across your writing on The Federalist when you're writing about the Electoral College and how uh, people who want to abolish it are retarded. Thought it was a great article. <laughs> that's and, your word, not mine. Yeah, she didn't say that, but that's basically the point she was making. And it's very valid. Founders agreed. Uh, but the reason I want to have you on is because you mentioned that you were a former pagan and you've kind of converted. And I'm a big time believer in the power of conversion stories. I mentioned in a video a long time ago that... Um, Christ's godly power was actually persuading people without using godly power, without using force. And that's the big challenge for us is can we convince people to change their ideas and their behavior without forcing them via government or the bullet head of a gun or whatever. And which is the reason I feel like nobody, everyone should be converted from progressivism is because it's all about forcing people, whether it's to accept yeah. their alternate lifestyles, behaviors, or uh, reality. So I want to talk to you today about your conversion story and kind of how you started at Berkeley. You admitted you were a pagan. I don't know what that means exactly, but I'm excited to hear it. And how life events shaped the way that you saw truth over time. Happy to tell you. Do you know what tarot cards are? Of course. I got hold okay, on. So I, got, so I did a tarot reading, tarot card reading every day for 10 years. I can do an astrology chart. I worship the goddess. I got married outside at night under the full moon. I mean, I was pagan. And then I ended up working at a downtown Oakland nursing home and black, 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 black. I loved it. But I was so surprised at these little nurse assistants who maybe hadn't even, maybe they had their GED if that. They were so much wiser than me and a lot of my friends that had graduated from college. And over time, I realized, huh, they were all raised in Bible believing churches. So that I just kind of, hmm, that's interesting. What did you mean because, wiser? What is wiser? What does that mean? Said, oh, oh, just, you know, not as, not as tossed about by the winds of, of, you know, life and just like, okay, you know, just, just very, very solid and grounded, not trying to be somebody they're not, you know, just really being good, solid down home people. And along about the same time, Ronald Reagan was reelected. And when I was in Berkeley, I thought he was the Antichrist, and so did everyone I know, everybody I knew. Of course. And the night that the election results were shown on the map, and, and he had taken every single state but Mondale's, a little light went on. I thought, hmm, I wonder if there are other ways to look at the world than the Berkeley way. So these things just kind of started to, 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 to grow in me. And then, you know, aging helps. I I moved back to San Diego when my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and that has a very maturing effect when you're dealing with a, an ill parent or a declining parent. And then I ended up actually meeting uh, a Mormon, a dreaded Mormon, who had never never had one before on my job. Wait, wait, and I with or just... without horns? <laughs> well, I don't think he had horns. Was no. he was but, in the Broadway uh, play or is it the real thing? Oh, real real deal. Mm, okay, and. I was just horrified at his beliefs and his politics and everything else. But I'll tell you, when you say, can we convince people, persuade people without force? He was such a good person. And he was such a good friend to me, even though we had no values in common. And I really tried to upset him. Like, oh, you can't handle a real woman like me. You're just a little Mormon boy. And he was just not thrown. And he didn't, you know, he didn't condemn a lot of what I did. He teases me that I broke all 10 commandments. But we were friends. We were literally friends. And, and it wasn't because I was Mormon or he was trying to make me Mormon. He just saw value in me and wanted to be my friend, whether or not I believe what he did. And that was so impressive to me that it made me open to what was important to him. And it, it was a long process. But How did, how did you that, square that with knowing that he actually deep down inside was a horrible person because of the things he did? <laughs> like, it, the way that if you read the Washington Post, like today, I, I, I call it the boogeyman. Like they don't believe in God, but they do believe in the boogeyman because everyone's out to get them. Big Pharma wants to kill you. Uh, religion wants to ungay you. They all want to harm you in some way. So like how did you square his behavior with the things that you knew he believed? I had a little bit of a nervous breakdown. In fact, on the outside, I was arguing hotly. He told me later that he could have filed a claim against me with HR for religious harassment. And he could have. I was very, very fierce. Mm. 
I couldn't help thinking about what he was saying. I was, I was listening on the inside because I saw how he treated his wife. I loved how he treated his wife. He was happy. I didn't even know you could be happy and I didn't know any happy people. So there was enough of a, of a draw there that I, that I wanted to, to figure it out. And truthfully, so I was this pagan recently divorced hoochie mama slut, whatever. I was everything your, your parents don't want you to be. But I thought that was how to be. I thought that was, you know, in fact, I felt sorry for him because he's like, you know, never had sex before he was married, hadn't tasted alcohol. I thought really nice guy, but missing out on what counts in life. Close minded, obviously. Yeah. Very close minded. So he started teaching me like I had never, ever, ever thought of myself as a daughter of God. And I would come in on Mondays and tell him about my dates over the weekend. He's like, Donna, don't you know you're a daughter of God, man? So he was just teaching me not not to convert me, but he was teaching me essentially the gospel by their fruit. You shall know them. So I started cleaning up my language, which was very, very rough. And I started conducting myself a little bit more with a little bit more dignity around men. And, you know, by their fruit, you shall know them. I could not I could not deny that it was bearing peace and happiness and contentment. And I mean, I just had never felt like that. I, I don't so, want to interrupt, but I have to know, I'm curious, what is the, what's your motivation? What's the intrinsic drive behind doing this? Cause changing your behavior, like you were right. And he was the closed minded one and you see that he's happy. What, at what point do you say, you know what, I'm going to try it just to taste it, just a sample. I'm going to try okay. changing. Well, when, when I say I was a pagan for 10 years, the truth is I've always been looking for the truth and I, I just throw myself in to whatever I'm exploring. So I had tried all these different things, you know, paganism. I went, I went the full depth. It wasn't it. And so because I'd never really found what I was looking for, it started to feel like a fit and I had never felt peace ever. So that was very, very compelling. And then it's so funny. Uh, I didn't want to be baptized Mormon. I was afraid to tell anyone I was even talking to Mormons. I knew my boyfriend would dump me if I did get baptized and he did. So one day I went and talked to my girlfriend. I said, what do you think I should do? You know, if I get baptized, uh, Brad's going to dump me. She said, keep the guy, lose the Mormons. Those people are so out there. Seriously. And I said, I know, I know, but I want to be devout. I want to be like, you know, like Jewish people where it's just the fabric of their life. But I decided she was right. So I went away and I swear to you for four days, the sun did not shine as brightly. The, the sky was not as blue. The birds didn't sing as sweetly. And I just realized, you know what? I have to be baptized. I know there's something there for me. doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks. I have to do it. And I did it. And it was awful. The, fir- the first six months, I felt like a wet dog in a hurricane. And it just came through and people left me. People abandoned me. Uh, it was very, very hard. But yet I knew it was right. And the longer I stayed with it, I've been in the church now 16 years it gets better and better and better. And I'm happier and happier and happier. So I know it was the best thing I ever did. Plus then I met my husband, we adopted our kids. All of that came subsequent to getting my head out of my back pocket. So I, I want to talk about that, the spiritual and political conversion. I just got an advanced copy of uh, Gosnell in the mail yesterday. I'm stoked. I read like two chapters and I actually fell asleep in bed with a highlighter out and I had highlighter all over me in the morning. <laughs> my wife's still making fun of me. But it's amazing to me that in the first in the preface of the book, one of the authors and Anne Mickelhenny starts it by saying that whenever she saw anti-abortion protests, pro-lifers would have pictures up. And she's like, that's so stupid. I mean, heart transplants are nasty too, but it doesn't mean they're not a good thing. And I'm sure that they're photoshopped and these people are fanatics. And in the book, she is a hardcore convert. She is the leader of the pack of these so-called fanatics that she used to mock and say they must not be serious. They have ulterior motives. This to me is what's so interesting. I look at how much of life is intended to deceive you, to get you to do things that bring you no happiness, bring you no joy or satisfaction. I have that. I wonder what someone like you, the perspective that you have, when you look at, like, say, what's going on in the transgender community, where the kids are getting younger, the schools are pushing it, the uh, even the millennials. You know, there, I saw, saw an article the other day that millennials are rush. A lot of them are looking at their tattoos and some of the modifications to their body, and they're trying to get them undone. And I feel how much of that is just them searching, trying to find something they can believe long to trying to sign, find the place where they fit in and how much of it is flat out lies that actually harm them in the long run. It, all of it. And I, I want to go back to the abortion thing. I, when I was married, I got pregnant and my husband said to me, you know, it's your decision, but I don't want a baby. 
And my girlfriends all said, oh, you can have, every woman gets one abortion. Go ahead. You can have your kids later. Interesting. And so I threw it away like the trash. I had, I had no conception that it was a child of God. I mean, that it was the golden ticket to all the meaning of life. And later when I realized it, it was too late. I never did have a chance to have biological children. That's why we adopted. But, oh. but I, I don't want to come down on women who, who have or, or, or want to have abortions. I just want to say to them, you have no idea the shark teeth of pain that will get sharper and sharper as you get older. I would rather educate them and try to help them see it's a quick fix. I mean, I, was, I couldn't wait to get it out of me. I, I can't believe it was me talking, but I couldn't wait to get it out of me. It was gone. I'm like, okay, awesome. You know, I go back to work with a better hairstyle and everyone's like, oh, you look so good. What happened? But then over time, when I realized what I had done, it was just, it's the, it's the heaviest regret of my entire life. Mm. So there's that. I think there's exposure to people who are willing to be real and talk about it. And then the transgender idea, I have such a hard time with that. I have really tried to do my due diligence on that. I've written for the Federalist about it. I have interviewed people about it. I have friends whose ones, her dad is transgender. The other one, her sister grew up telling her parents, I want a penis for my, for Christmas. And her parents are like, no, no, you're a girl. And now she's happily married, right? Adjusted. So here's my thing on transgender. I really can't make up my mind because on the one hand, if it is a mental illness, that's a very serious, those are very serious stakes. But if it's not a mental illness, I'm just not ready to to either, I'm just not ready to commit. I want to be open-minded. And I think transgender bathrooms are a stupid idea. I think a lot of the politics around it is stupid, <clears throat> but the idea of whether or not there is such a thing, I tend to think no, but I'm just not quite ready to put that nail in the coffin. Well, thank you for sharing your story. The thing about this that got me is so much of it is about the politics. You know, when they raided Gaz, I haven't finished it yet, but when they raided Gosnell, so you have Ann McElhenney, who's not a huge believer in the pro-life movement. You have Gosnell and you have the Pennsylvania State Medical Board and the health people who've all gone and checked his clinic and gave him sparkling reviews about what a great job he's doing. Meanwhile, ignoring the horrors, these are the people who are supposed to care about you. These are the people who get elected based on the fact that they love you and they want you to be safe and they don't want evil, you know, God-fearing Republicans to come take away your abortions. And she basically comes to the conclusion that all this is a giant lie and it's about money and power, which is we share the same faith that the big deception was about power and control and ultimately taking away your agency. So when I look at things where they're shrouded in confusion and when they're separated by divisions of politics, I ultimately say, qui bono, who benefits and how much power am I giving someone else over if I buy into this argument? And so I don't see things in Republican and Democrat so much as what did the decisions get me closer to liberty or further away? Am I giving power over myself to somebody else? And with transgenderism, I've interviewed um, the gentleman who wrote for the Federalist also on the website. Well hired. Well hired. Thank you. And he talked about that. He's like, the, the day that I did this was the best day of my life because everything got worse after that immediately. We call it new car smell, right? So as you drive <laughs> off the lot, like that's as great as it's going to get. It's all downhill from there. And I think that there's a lot of truth in that for many things in life. It's all about whether or not you buy that deception. And if you do, things are just going to get worse. And th what I don't like is that if you have a conversation and say, look, if you're not out, if the, if you, the jury's out for you on whether or not transgenderism is real or not, then let's at least talk about the facts and the statistics that we know mm -hmm. about. But you can't do that because that's insensitive and politically oh, yeah. not correct. And these days you can actually be punished. You're, you can lose your job for it. You can, be, you can be harassed. You, you just not, you can be Meryl Streep basically is what I'm saying. So. You say you, you, you make your decisions. Are you going closer or further away from Liberty? And Liberty isn't even a value that we teach anymore. You look at these college campuses who actually believe that certain speech should be banned speech that hurts people's feelings. They don't have the first clue what Liberty is. And so uh, I know from being on the other side before that they think we're the Ku Klux Klan. We're not worth debating. You wouldn't debate the Ku Klux Klan. I would, because I'll talk to anyone. I would too. But, but because we're just dismissed without any, any consideration, they never are exposed. In fact, my business partner in the Don't Unfriend Me, gay, progressive, conservative Mormon, we've been friends for years, and I've been unfriended by three people since the election. So we thought, you know what? We debate these really controversial issues. Why don't we do that sort of on the road and say, look, people, you can have agreeable disagreement. But we've never gotten so deep down into it as now. And I tell you, the shock on his face when he hears my views, he's never encountered them or he didn't think someone with decency would have them. 
And I can tell that he's having to kind of, you know, make the adjustment. Whereas I know all the liberal progressive views. I just have chosen a different way of looking at it. But I think so many of them just are never. When I was in Berkeley, my gosh, Christians, white people, straight people, oh, they were the worst. I would never have had any Republicans. They made me nauseous. I would never have had anything to do with them. It's interesting to me because I know people who feel that way on Facebook. When I had the article about how young progressive women defriend more people than anyone, uh-huh. that's the friend I have that I shoot stuff to and she loses her mind and she yeah. doesn't defriend me because we've known each other a long time. But I'm a horrible person for even thinking those things. Right. And uh, it's interesting to me because I use examples like what the mask is kind of coming off after the Trump inauguration. Everything's mm-hmm. kind of flipped in terms of what you're allowed to say, whether or not the government is good or bad, whether or not the presidency can be used for evil purposes. I mean, we're, I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone. But when that dude chased Ivanka onto the flight and harassed her and bragged about it, I said to myself, who's the evil person here? What did Ivanka right. do to deserve this? Who acted right. un, uh, unkindly, unpolitely, or just whatever you want to say. But when I argue with my progressive friends, I'm like, this is you and I'm Ivanka. You hate me for doing nothing and you're acting out. You're, you're, you're like kind of, I did a video about the guy at uh, Grubhub. Uh-huh. You have this paranoid delusional fear that other people are going to do bad things. So what do you do? You actually do bad things as a precursor to prevent that from happening. Like that makes you the bad person. You're the one that needs to check yourself. The other thing I think that uh, Democrats and liberals are drunk on is that they are so sure they're right. In fact, when I was debating my friend the other day, I said, you know, it seems like you think you have the moral high ground. He said, I do. We do. We're more Christian. And I said, well, that's that's really not going to go over well if we're doing this as a business, because if you communicate that contempt to people who don't think like you, we're not going to have anybody want to hear us. But I said, look, you know me. You know I'm not an a-hole. So if I have these views, is it possible that these views are not as cold and as evil as you think they are. It's just a different way of doing it. In fact, I I told them, you know, Democrats, they confuse values with methods. So we all want children not to go to bed hungry at night, but liberals want to, oh, you know, you can't do anything. We'll just do it for you, poor baby. And conservatives are like, you know, nope, you do it yourself. You'll feel much better about yourself in the long run if you have self-respect and you can do it. We believe in you. So they're completely the same values, totally opposite methods. And because the methods are opposite, we're just shunned. Where I, I in my in my piece I'm working on for the Federalists, I go through and I actually break down how everything that that Republicans or conservatives do, where you're you're looking to actually honor people. When you when you have compassion like liberals, it's actually contempt. Oh, you're marginalized, so you can't be held accountable to the same standards. It's like the soft bigotry of low expectations. Right. That's cruel. That is cruel. To tell somebody you'll never get out from underneath your race or your gender, that is cruel because it's not true. That's, that is awful. Yeah. I mean, if you, you just look at examples, I use the black community a lot because I read a lot of Walter Williams, a lot of Thomas Sowell. And the great thing about them is the Thomas historical Sowell. perspective that in the 40s and 50s, Despite the fact that there was so much more racism, there was parity statistically in terms of uh, in terms of unemployment, literacy, legitimacy, the things that they're really suffering with in the black community today. They were doing a lot better back then. So yeah. now, but the expectation is if you can't get a driver's license on your own, if you're too weak to get a job without the government's help, and if you can't get into college without an SAT boost, then really you're kind of just too stupid to do anything. And the people who are making that argument, like they're telling you exactly how they feel about you. Right. You're basically borderline retarded and it just comes along with being black. But the second you're not, you're a mediocre Negro, which is what Mark. (laughs) Oh, that is the worst. I thought white trash was the worst thing you could say about anybody ever. But mediocre Negro, that just went way above, way above mediocre. It wasn't even the Negro part. Mediocre. Oh, my gosh. Mediocre. Mediocre. That is just outrageous. Yeah, that's contemptuous for sure. Oh, Oh, like nothing I've ever heard. Tell me about your political conversion. So I understand the religious was a big change in your life, but when did you start to see that maybe everything you knew was wrong? Oh, oh, I get, I get, sorry, I forgot about this. Okay, so I moved down to San Diego, and the only thing that kept me going was Howard Stern was on the radio there. Okay. And I had, uh, I was a nursing home administrator in the Bay Area. I tried to get a job like that in San Diego, and I went to this association of health facilities meeting at a local hotel. And... At the beginning of the meeting, they had a moment of silence, and I was just fuming that it was so obviously code for prayer. And so I was just really, really, really just annoyed and irked. Conservative San Diego, ugh, white conservative affluent. And then you're not a hateful. You're not a hateful bigot at this point either, right? Because no, no, 
oh, I just, I just knew I was, I knew I was right. Yeah. Like I knew I was the smartest person. Just because you hate all of them doesn't make you hateful or intolerant. Right. Yeah, and it. then I started listening to Dr. Laura and because I could always see many different sides to an issue. It's, it's very hard to believe now. I didn't have strong opinions because I could be convinced with this or convinced with that. And after listening to her for a while, I decided, you know what? I am willing to go out on a limb and say, no matter what anybody else thinks, my opinion is that it is best for children to be raised by biologically, biological parents married in the home. Like, boom, I believe that. I, I, will, I, will, I will stake my, my reputation on that. And I don't care what anyone else says about it. Well, from that, it was like a little seed and other things started to come on top of it because that's a very good foundation to have that. And so it was really that it was it was it was finding a way. Finding my own voice, like what I really, really thought. And I still do see from different points of view, but yet I'm very um, solid in what I think because I've tried everything. So I know what really works. You've tried it all. So uh, well, my book's called One of Everything. <laughs> It is funny. I, I love trolling on the internet. And what I found I is that when it's a hateful, or what's a loving, intolerant, progressive, uh, ultimately when you back them in a corner, it's always, well, progressives are smarter, more of them go to college, they make more money. And oh, I've, I've seen, heard that. The, my, that's my favorite one is, you know that statistically progressives have higher IQs. I'm like, well, when you find one, let me know so you can introduce me to them. And then the end of the conversation, because for me, it's, it's a thing of, okay, so there's someone out there in the netherworld that's actually knows this stuff, but I don't. And you're hateful. And you, it's kind of like fact checking. I'm like this whole thing about fact checking fake news came out. I'm like the only reason fact checking exists is because people don't know anything. They have to that's be right. able to go. Remember the guy at, um, when Ted Cruz was ripping the guy from the Sierra Foundation, and every mm -hmm. time he'd say, what about the pause? 17 years, scientists saying the pause. How do you account for that? He's the head of the Sierra Foundation. He would go. Right. Like, that's fact checking. That's how you pantomime right. it. Like, hold on a minute. Someone knows yeah. that, and I'm going to go ask him. I don't. I just know that you're wrong. Hold on a second. Like, that's what I think of for fact checking. Would we need yeah. fact checking if people actually knew anything? But people are busy and, you know, headlines are clickbait. And I, and I honestly don't hold it against them because when I do my research, I go way, way down deep. And oftentimes it doesn't matter whether it's a conservative or a liberal. <clears throat> they've heard their side say something. In fact, I'll give you one example. I wrote a piece about um, the, the absentee votes that were not counted mm -hmm. after the election. And I quoted... A, a statement on the American Thinker website that said 60 some odd percent of uh, absentee ballots are Republican from the Navy, whatever overseas. No, sorry, yeah. And I quoted that and somebody challenged me on it. So I thought, oh, OK, so I went back to find out where that come from. Well, I couldn't find out. And so I Googled it. It was half a dozen places all over the Internet, all referencing back to the American Thinker. I could never independently source that fact. And I even emailed them and said, hey, you know, can you tell me where you got this fact? And I never heard back. So I think not necessarily out of maliciousness, but people are just convinced they have this confirmation bias, right? So if they read something they already know is true, like, yep, that's it. 60% of absentee right. ballots are Republican. So I have a big, um, a big investment in fact checking. In fact, my business partner and I are doing something called uh, deep dives, where, you know, deep dive down. He's an attorney. I'm an MBA. And so right now we're doing sanctuary cities. Little mini ebooks, about a couple hours, and so the the status, the 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 info, the history, the foundation. He analyzes it legally, and honestly, I thought I knew more about sanctuary cities than I do. And I was, I thought, wow. From now on, if I haven't seen it for myself or verified it for myself, I don't say it because I see how cotton candy and how fluffy stuff is out there and people really don't know. They don't care. They just read the headlines. It's a good point for me. It's about the pattern though. Like fake news is the big push. And why does fake news exist? Because we already had it. Like, uh, I think it's either Savage or Levin who talk about the, the left is always going to accuse you of what they're actually doing, right? So if you're pushing yeah. out fake news, the truth is they've been doing it for a long time and right. now there's a lot more real news out there. So they got to call it fake because they've lost credibility. And I look at fact checking the very same way. Like if you, if the news comes out and you get fact checked by truth, they go, well, we're going to fact check that. That's not, that hasn't been fact checked, which is why social media and Facebook are going to do it. Like if they had the opportunity to tell the truth and didn't do it, then fact checking is the fallback for why your truth is not as good as their truth. And I, so I agree with this whole thing that you just did with your hands. And, but not only that Snopes, right? That's the go-to for fact checking. It's the only one I use. I, yeah. The only one you need. That's not true because I wrote an article about the college, um, Hampshire college in new England 
that removed the American flag after Trump was elected. I wrote a very, I said, I'm not, I'm not easily made angry. I was very angry. They fact checked my article and they were incorrect. I thought, oh, if I'm wrong, I'll admit it. So I went and went to the actual university itself and the website and saw what they said about it. And you know what? Snopes was wrong. And yet everybody goes to Snopes. What you got to do is you got to find something that's hundred percent unverifiably unver- correct and go to Snopes and it'll say, maybe could have happened. Partial truth. That's a, they, they grade on this 50% curve towards untruth when it is. Right. I mean, how hard is that? Le- leans toward, leans toward. I could do that in my sleep. Yeah. I don't even it's like, it. If you go to Snopes and say, did Monica Lewinsky really give, you know, Bill Johnson the cigar? It'll say, depends on what the meaning of the word is, is like, that's how they fact check stuff, which, which is cool. I just want to know it's truth. If that's their agenda and that's their slant, that's fine. But I always okay. use Snopes. I want to invest in them actually. Okay. Well, I have a perfect example of why we can't see things the same way. Good. You get down to it. Hillary Clinton made the statement. I did not knowingly transmit classified information, right? It's not verifiable. It's not objectively measurable. She's the only one that knows if it's true. She may not even be remembering correctly. So it starts right there. If you don't like her, which I don't, you say, look what she's trying to get away with. If you do like her, which my business partner does, he says, well, leave the poor woman alone. They've investigated her so many times. If there was something there, I would have found it. But because you can never get below subjective statements it's really about a judgment call are you going to go in her favor which in which case she's being harassed or against her in which case she's so corrupt and you can't you can't bridge that divide because it really has to do with how you see I, if it's a shallow conversation i keep it service level and go look let's say you're it's what she's saying is true and i'm not going to use the enemy of the state equipment against her and go that i'm gonna this requires the willing suspension of disbelief also her line but Okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Are you going to elect someone to be president that has the memory of my dead no, grandmother? No, 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 not at all. I don't, I don't say that That's at all. I'm to just your saying, friend. like, I don't, I have better judgment than that. Like, I wouldn't do it. Right. But they, and, and they, they don't think they're hiding, but that's what I'm saying because they really sincerely believe that this poor woman has just been investigated forever and nothing's ever turned up and leave her alone. That's leave certainly, her alone. That's, so they think that we make it all up. They think we make it all up. It's a vast right-wing conspiracy. Yes, exactly. It's funny no one's ever calling it that because that's definitely what it is. It's obvious. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm curious to see what work you have in the future. You said you're working on a book and articles. What, what's coming out next? So my next article, hopefully the Federalists were published, and it's this whole, like, why are the Democrats so wigged out? They're just losing their minds. And my thesis is that they have bought into their social justice vision as though it, their utopia, as though it's reality, as though you can legislate women in combat and that, you know, if they, if they impair the unit's readiness or combat effectiveness, that somehow, you know, it doesn't matter that, that the legislation is somehow going to protect the increased risk of harm or death to every member of that unit, right? They, they think they can legislate the world they, the way they want it to be. And they were so sure they were right. They, they knew they would never lose power again. They got rid of the filibuster. They have executive orders more than you can take, stake a sh- stake, shake a stick at. And then, oh, Obamacare. I, I really, I double checked this. Not a single Republican in the House, not a single Republican in the Senate voted for it. And they've just now like, oh, we're going to be in power forever. You'll never get it back. <gasps> what? What? We tied it all up in a nice little bundle for ourselves and now we don't have it. And now you have all the power. I think that's so funny. I was but, nervous because, I mean, FDR said we'd never get rid of Social Security. And so far it's been 70, not, 80 years and well, he was right. I, I don't I don't think you get I don't think you get rid of entitlements. You really don't. You can reshape them. I don't think you get rid of them. But the, the Democrats, they're just so, you know, I, I, we, we want, we don't want touchy feely men. In real life, we want uh, men who are brutal enough to handle Iraq or Vietnam or Afghanistan or whatever comes next. And, you know, being insensitive to people's feelings is great, but hard as flint is a survival skill. And they're the ones standing between us and, you know, the destruction of our freedom. So we don't want touchy feely men. We do want rich people. We want people to buy yachts and, and private jets and tickets to the symphony because all of those who are carpenters and electricians and do um, make fiberglass or steel reinforced cement or bilges, well, somebody's got to buy their product for them to have money to support their families. So if the rich are buying luxury goods, it supports this whole ecosystem of economic well-being. And 
you know, you name it, the tag. I, I just, I just think you guys, okay, I'm really, I'm ready to call, call you on your stuff. You have made this world that you think is real. And look what happened. It, it, it wasn't real. And you're losing your mind. You cannot grok that what you were sure was true doesn't seem to be. Yeah, it's, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, one thing I want to mention from this. I watched a series from 2005 on Netflix last week called Auschwitz. Have you seen it by chance? No. So good. Anyone who's watching and you, Donna, go watch Auschwitz on Netflix. It's really fantastic. There and in this book and in a book I read recently about John C. Calhoun, where it was called the uh, it was the argument for slavery. And the author talks about how in the South, the pro-slavery Southerners had really well thought out and persuasive arguments for slavery. And we look back now and go, oh, people had slaves. They were awful human beings. We forget who those people were and which party they were a part of and why they fought the Civil War to keep it. But also the fact that there was a persuasive argument for keeping it the way it was and why it was the best thing for blacks. And it was actually okay to break up their families because, you know, they had all these things. And then you read Gosnell and Mickelhenny is making all these arguments why Gosnell and people from the state and the health department are saying, you know what, this is actually a great public service that's happening here. Yeah, there's some, there's some kinks we got to work out. The same thing you hear for Obamacare. The same thing you right. hear for... Uh, a million different political ideologies, even in Auschwitz, they have these German SS soldiers who evaded capture for all these years. And now they're saying, well, I'm not really remorseful because Jews are bad people and they controlled the banks and they kind of, you know, bankrupted Germany and they were causing all these problems. And, and we were just doing what we we're told and everything except for, I accept the truth. What I did was horrible. I'm a bad person. That's what you don't hear. And I look at it the same way I look at when Obama said, yeah, there's not really any shovel ready jobs. I'm like, I knew that. I knew that from the beginning. Like, it's all nonsense. It's all fake news. Everything's fake. And human beings, you know, they can get through a day without water better than they can get through a day without a rationalization. Whatever they're doing, they rationalize that they're good, they're right. So part of that is just human nature. In fact, that's one of the things I say in my piece is that the utopia that the Democrats are after, A, they have to undo all of the laws of physics all the laws of biology and all the laws of human nature and economics to yeah. make this to make this reality work. And you know, as one grounded in reality, don't hold your breath. It it doesn't happen that way. But because they never get to that perfection, they're never satisfied. When was the last time you heard a progressive say, you know what, we have come a long way since slavery, since Jim Crow, since the civil rights? No, no, no. It's as long as one black person anywhere ever is given even the a dirty look for being black. Oh. We're not done. We're a racist society. Yeah, you, you can't tell me how, how horrible things are and then talk about how far we've come. It's got, it's kind of one or the other at this point. Cause life is amazing. It's pretty good. Um, what is the main, before I let you go, your partner on don't unfriend me, what is his main issue? What's his main gig? Cause I have an idea of something I want you to talk about on a show that I'd like to okay. even discuss. He, he just quit his job to work full time, you know, for himself as a, as a writer. And he is just terrified that, he will lose Obamacare, that he will not have a way to to uh, provide for his health care. And he's got some serious health issues that he really does need, you know, health insurance. So I get that. I, I, I But I, I just think there's a better way to do it. I just I think, you know, if we had an Amazon for insurance and people just went there and got what they wanted, private market, private market. But Amazon. Oh, my gosh. Overnight. Yeah. I mean, he's. He should, I think about the guys from uh, Freakonomics who said, if we were rational, oh, we'd, sc we'd scream and run every time we saw French fries. That's how your friend should react when he sees Obamacare. It's going to kill him someday. He's got the VA plan right now. Hope he enjoys it. Um, do an episode on gay parent, parents and children, gay children, parents of gay yes. children. I had. We, yeah, we want to do, all, We, in fact, on our Facebook page, Don't Unfriend Me, we say if you have topics you want us to cover, do it because it's it's perfect he holds me accountable i hold him accountable so there's no spin there's no wiggle room we just force each other to be absolutely on point and accurate we we, we want to be the cliff's notes for issues it's too bad only one of you can be right <laughs> <laughs> that's what i tell him i Don, tell him it's okay it's been a real pleasure where can people go find you is the don't unfriend me site ready or do they got to Catch up with the but don't unfriend me on Facebook right now. That's the best place. We're setting up our website, but don't okay. unfriend me Facebook. Very, very, very good stuff. We're kind of chronicling. We've had these dust ups, these fights. And so I blog about everything. So I blog about it. And then for me personally, uh, you can just go to Donna Carol Voss.com and there's links to all my books and my, and my articles and my fascinating life history and 
just a wonder, just a wonder. Check me out. So nice to have you on the show. Great discussion. And I look forward to, uh, I look forward to more. Thanks for coming on. Likewise. Thank you. You're listening to the absolute unadulterated truth. Courtesy of the Oh Hail Yeah Show. Want more? Hail yeah, you do. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the Young Cons podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud. And make sure to check us out online at youngcons.com slash podcast. Or chat us up on Twitter at RealTJHale. But I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in.